Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn to the New Testament book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. It follows the Gospel of John, and it is an exciting, exciting book. It's perhaps, as far as action is concerned, the, uh, one of the most exciting books in the Bible. Um, as we look at our outline, the uh, book of Acts was written by Luke, Dr. Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And it's really a continuation of his uh, book of Luke, which was about the life of Jesus. And now he's going to talk about what happened after Jesus ascended. We're going to talk about the apostles and others who are going to uh, continue to spread the good news of salvation through their risen Savior. They're going to share it in word, and they're also going to share it by deed, by actions. So Acts records uh, basically the ministry of Peter in the first 12 chapters, and then the ministry of Paul from chapters 13 to 28. Those are the two principal characters, Peter and then Paul. Uh, for an outline for the book of Acts, I think probably the words of Jesus serve us well in chapter 1 and verse 8, which we'll cover tonight. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I think the lesson for us in the book of Acts is that Acts continues even to this day, written in the lives of all believers. So it was Peter, and then it was Paul, now it's Jerry, and then put your own name in there too because the work is still going on and we're a part of it. We're going to learn how to be really an exciting part of the work of God tonight. Father, we're really grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to understand it and truly be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look tonight at Acts chapter 1, the promise of the Spirit. Here we find that uh, the purpose of the Book of Acts is given in the prologue here, as Luke tells us that he wants to continue the account of Jesus' ministry through the apostles. And again, you and I are to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ in our world today. Now, the Lord makes these disciples of his with whom he lived and ministered three and a half years. He makes them wait until they receive the power that they need. And that power is going to come through the promise of the Father, through the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, this empowering is going to help them to become witnesses for him. Uh, and then he's going to ascend into heaven. He'll sit at the right hand of God the Father, and he will then send the Holy Spirit who will empower the disciples to do the will. Uh, the disciples continue in prayer. Peter, who is their leader, uh, cites scriptures and indicates they need to replace Judas, who, of course, was the one who betrayed the Lord and then committed suicide. So after prayer and after casting lots, they choose Judas's replacement, a man named Matthias. And the lesson, I think, here for chapter 1 is we need the Holy Spirit's empowering in order to live as witnesses for the Lord Jesus. So let's begin now with chapter 1 and verse 1 of the book of Acts. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So here in this introduction, this prologue, we have the purpose for the book of Acts. And Luke, who was a physician, uh, accompanied Paul at times, and he witnessed um, through the testimony of others the life of Jesus. He never knew Jesus himself, but he did a lot of interviewing. He was very thorough. You're going to see that Luke in his gospel and the book of Acts has a physician's mentality and a physician's approach, very, very detailed. 
If you've ever been to a doctor, we have a couple of nurses present here, uh, you'd be nervous if the doctor said, well, I did some exams and things look pretty good and what's going on? Well, it could be good, could be better, but basically overall, uh, doctor, I'd like to have a little more specificity. Well, the, the blood work could use a little, give me the details. We want absolute details. And so frankly, um, we want doctors who know what they're talking about, who are very specific and who will tell us exactly what we need to know. Luke does that. He's not general. He's very specific. And like a physician, he's fascinated by the physical healing that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. He'll talk about healings like none of the other disciples do. He talked about it in the book of Luke. He was very specific about the healings and really quite taken by the healing power of God. So if you are in the medical profession, then you'll really enjoy Luke's approach towards the life of Jesus and now the life of the apostles uh, and others who live after him. So he says in verse 1, the former account I made, referring to the book of Luke. And Theophilus, we don't know who he was. He was obviously an acquaintance of Luke, somebody that he felt uh, he wanted to share the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and now the life of the apostles in the book of Acts. And I thank God that he did write this because it offers extremely important material for us about not only Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, but Jesus working through the apostles uh, thereafter. And so it talks about uh, what Jesus began both to do and to teach. The Gospel of Luke is pretty much uh, involved with that. Jesus did and he taught. He performed miracles and he taught about the kingdom of God. Uh, we need to be the same in our lives. We need to teach and we need to do. There are doers who are not good teachers and there are teachers who are not good doers. We need to be both. We need to do and we need to teach. So we go out and we demonstrate the life of Jesus. We demonstrate the fact that Jesus is working today through us. We need to exemplify it and then we need to teach it. If we don't do it and we just teach, it has a tendency to sound hypocritical. Now, I'm not going to live for Christ, but I want you to live for Christ. I'm not going to live a life of purity, but I want you to live a life of purity. What is that all about? So we need to do and then we need to teach others to do that. Um, and so we, uh, verse 2, he did this until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the Lord continued to minister uh, right on through to the time he was taken up. And then through the Holy Spirit, uh, he had given commandments to the apostles. You remember Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit in uh, the Gospel of John? Uh, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he is going to teach you. He'll be your comforter. He'll be your guide. He's going to convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Well, Jesus was going to leave them alone. They had been with Jesus for three and a half years, and then he was about to ascend to be with the Father. But he, Jesus, would send the Holy Spirit to them to guide them and to direct them. And that same Holy Spirit is available today to us to be our comforter, to be our parakletos in the Greek, our lawyer, the one who goes alongside of us to assist us. And he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Again, the details of a physician. Jesus presented himself alive after his resurrection uh, on many occasions, and in Luke's terms, they were infallible or unmistakable proofs. Again, being a physician, he wants evidence. And he witnessed uh, a lot of that evidence by talking to people who actually knew the Lord, who knew the accounts. Again, he's a very detailed person. And in his mind, it was absolutely beyond question that Jesus appeared many times after his resurrection. He was very alive and very well. He was seen by them during 40 days. It wasn't just one brief appearance. He was actually moving here on earth in his resurrection body for 40 days after his resurrection. 
and he was speaking about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, that goes back to the beginning for him, before he uh, even was baptized by John the Baptist. John talked about the coming kingdom. Jesus talked about and demonstrated the coming kingdom, the peace, the purity, the power, the miracles, the standards that the kingdom requires. And Jesus continued to preach about that. The book of Acts will continue that theme about the kingdom of God. And guess what? You and I are to do the same thing. We're to tell others about Jesus, tell others about the kingdom of God. We're to demonstrate it. We demonstrate it through our lives. People should look at our lives and say they're different. They're different in the sense that they have a different kingdom. They're not plugged into and following the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of self. They're following the kingdom of God. And you and I are to do that. And that's a good prayer for us. We ought to get up in the morning and say, Lord, I want to not only be living in the kingdom of God, but I want to demonstrate it. And I want others to come to the kingdom as they look at my life. So that's the prologue. I'm writing to tell you about Jesus who appeared many times after he was raised from the dead for a period of 40 days. And he was talking about the kingdom of God. Now in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. The disciples are assembled together. We're not sure how many there are. We're going to see shortly there are 120 gathered together on another occasion. But he's going to give them a commandment. And I find it very interesting that these are the men primarily that he lived with for three and a half years. These are the men who went with Jesus to not only hear his message, but see him heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. They themselves did it. He commissioned them to go on out. These 12, another 70. And they came back and they were excited. They said, even the demons are subject to us. And the Lord said, that's not so exciting as the fact that in me, your names are written in the book of heaven, the book of life. But they were able to demonstrate all these powerful wonderful aspects of the kingdom. Now suddenly, go nowhere, fellas, you have nothing. What happened? He's talking about this. During the three and a half years recorded in the Gospels, I was with you. I was the one who enabled you to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Now I'm going to leave, go to heaven, sit at the right hand of God the Father, and I'll be with you in spirit, but not here in person. So you cannot go on your own because apart from me, you can do nothing. He told them that in John 15 about the fact that he was the vine and they were the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. So I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you and he is going to enable you to do this work. So here are veterans of living with the Lord and working with the Lord for three and a half years. Suddenly they can't do anything because it was never their doing. It was his doing through them. And so he's saying here, being assembled, not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, uh, which you have heard from me. The Father's going to make a promise, and I'm going to send to you the third person in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And then he's talking about this baptism with the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, John, referring to John the Baptist, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John the Baptist had a ministry that was very simple. 
Down by the Jordan River, he would baptize Jews who would come to him and repent and be looking for the coming of the kingdom, looking for the Messiah who'd be coming. And so he would baptize them. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, and it means to immerse. It's the picture of a ladle going into the water, or the bucket of water coming up so you can take a drink. It's complete submersion. And so he's saying, even as John completely submerged you in water as a sign of repentance and cleansing from sin, so the Holy Spirit is going to come and you're going to be baptized with or in the Holy Spirit. You who are saved, you disciples who walked with me for three and a half years, you're going to be immersed in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be baptized or immersed in him. So now we're talking about a new relationship with the Holy Spirit, which they did not know. And many in Christendom don't know it today. That is, there's actually three relationships with the Holy Spirit that are possible. Jesus talks about this in the Gospels. He talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit is with, para, the unbeliever. He is with every single unbeliever in this seven billion person world. He's with everyone trying to convict them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, we don't try to put too much weight upon little prepositions, but the word para or with is very important. The Holy Spirit is with everybody in the world, meaning he's coming alongside of them. He's not in them. They're not saved, but he's with the unbeliever, trying to convict that unbeliever to come to Christ. Then Jesus talks about another relationship. Once you receive Christ, you are in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit's in you. The Greek word is en, E-N, and it means the Holy Spirit now is in the believer. And all believers, every believer has the Holy Spirit in him or her. That's part of the relationship with God. That's part of being saved. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians, and he mentions in chapter 12 that the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. He also talks about the Holy Spirit placing you into Christ. And... Uh, he says, uh, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you and he baptizes you into the body of Christ. So there are several baptisms going on here. There's a baptism in water. There's the baptism of salvation where the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ. Now, there's another relationship that once the Holy Spirit is going to be coming upon you, we're going to see that word epi, E-P-I, he comes upon you, he overflows you. And it's the idea, again, of submersion, a submersion into the water. You go into the swimming pool, you go into the lake, you go into the ocean, and you hold your breath and you go underneath the water. You are submerged. That's the picture here of what God wants these disciples to have. I want you submerged in the Holy Spirit. Not just a little dab will do you, but I want you right in there, totally. It's totally surrounded and immersed, and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. All right, they're very confused. We can't go anywhere. We can't do anything. You told us to go throughout the world. And he's saying, don't go until you have the equipment that you need. How many times did you get a job, and uh, you were told... You got a job, but you can't do anything. Now you're going to be in training for a couple of weeks. Nurses have to have training, don't they? It goes on, and you can't go anywhere until you have that training. And you get people under you who you say, no, don't, you don't know anything. Uh, you've got to wait till the training is complete. Then you can go. So verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So now they understood this side of the cross, that he had to die. He's already died. He's been raised from the dead. Will you restore the kingdom? You're telling us about the kingdom of God. Can we have it right now here on earth? And they really wanted that. But it wasn't to be. The kingdom of God with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning here on earth was not to be yet at that time. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, 
It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So as far as when I'm going to come and restore the kingdom, it is not for you to know times or seasons because the Father has put that in his own authority. Elsewhere, he said not even the Son would know. Not even the Son while he was here on earth would know that. And yet there have been people, I've been subject to ministries where there would be date setting. How many of you ever had that experience? Where somebody would say, some prominent teacher would say, now the Lord's going to come at so-and-so time. And yet the Lord tells us very particularly that you're not going to know the time, not even going to know the season. We know we're getting closer. Every day we're getting closer to the return of the Lord, but he's not going to give that to us. That's for the Holy Spirit. That's for the Son of God. That's for the Father to know. Uh, but it's not for us to know. We're to keep busy. So keep your eyes off the coming of the kingdom. Keep your eyes on the coming as far as the goal, as far as sharing the good news with others. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the harvest in front of us, the harvest field. Were you ever in school? Of course you were. Did you think about graduation? How will I look when I have that cap and gown? Da, 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 da. And there goes Jerry, and I'm going to take the tassel and move it here. And uh, that's great. But that was daydreaming. That was daydreaming because I was like four years away from graduation if I made it at all. And so good to keep your eyes on graduation, but you don't live in the graduation moment because you now have another three or four years of slugging it out with homework and exams, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is with life. So yeah, being with the Lord and the kingdom, that's graduation. That's going to be exciting. But we keep our eyes on that and it helps to motivate us to be pure and holy and to get the good news out to others about the kingdom. But day-to-day -day slugging it out in this world with all sorts of problems is the order of the day. Keep your eyes off the kingdom in terms of can it happen now and get your eyes on the work at hand. Here's the work at hand, verse 8. But you shall receive power, dunamis. That's the Greek word. What words do we get in English that speak of power? Dunamis. Dynamic? Dynamite? That's what he's talking about. Real power from heaven. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There it is. New relationship with the Holy Spirit. Not para, with, for the unbeliever. Not en, en, for all believers. But now, for those believers who are going to receive it and be open to it, there'll be a new relationship upon you. Again, these are disciples who lived with Jesus, who ministered with him, and certainly the Holy Spirit was with their lives and in them, but he wasn't upon them. When I was young, I would get into a little wading pool. You had them in your backyard. Your mother would blow up a little wading pool, and it would go up to your ankles, and you could sit, and it might come up to your, uh, your, your little tummy, and that was about it when you were very young. And so you were in water. But again, using that analogy I used before, when you finally started swimming and got into that pool, that lake or the ocean, and you could go blub, blub, blub toward the bottom, you were really having the water upon you. And well, you weren't just in it, you were actually having it surround you. That's what he's talking about. And it's going to come upon you. And you're going to have that kind of power. And why that power? To show off to your friends? No. Power to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. The point is we are to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus. We are here to witness for him, not ourselves. We're not here to just make our own way and make our own kingdom. We're here as servants to represent and witness him. Down in the United Nations, in New York City, there are ambassadors from all over the world. They should be, and to, for the most part I think are, representing their countries. They're not there on their own. They're simply witnessing for and representing their countries. So we are the same for Jesus. We're not here for ourselves. We're here to witness for and represent him as ambassadors in this world. So you need power. You're going to need power in this world because there'll be oppositions from the devil, from your own flesh, from the, uh, the spirit of this world apart from Christ, all sorts of obstacles. But you're going to receive power 
when you have the Holy Spirit. Not just be in him and have him in you, but be immersed in him. And then as you're a witness for him, you're going to be going into your immediate world, your Jerusalem. That's where they were living. Uh, then a little bit further out into Judea, and then a little bit north up in Samaria, and then you go throughout the whole earth. You might say today, what you're going to do is you're going to start, once you become saved, you're going to start in your, your Jerusalem. Who's your Jerusalem? Your family. Who's your Judea and Samaria? Maybe the people at work, in your social life. You have clubs that you belong to. And then who's the world? Well, the world used to be when you traveled someplace and you met somebody, a taxi cab driver here, a waitress there. Now, yeah, with the internet, with uh, all sorts of social media, the world is literally the world. You can reach the world. You know, you can just go on YouTube, and if you don't know how to do it, Kiri will help you with that. We do that with this program. It'll be on the YouTube, available to the whole world. And right now, we are being seen in more than more than half the nations in the world. Over 80, 90 nations have witnessed these programs. And that's not just us. You can do it yourself. You can get a guitar out, play your harmonica, stroke your cat, brush your dog, do a video, and make it go worldwide. If you're creative, it could be absolutely dynamic, and it will go viral overnight. Who knows? But uh, you can reach the world. You can get on Christian chat rooms. You know, that's one of the most effective ways to get into countries, and there are a number, especially Muslim countries, where it is illegal uh, and even punishable by death to bring a convert to uh, Christ, especially for the person in that nation. And uh, you know how they're coming to Christ? You can't go on the street corners in Iran. Iran. You can't go on the street corners in uh, other nations. What you have to do, you try this in some of the African nations that are Muslim, and you'll be in deep trouble. So what do you do? You go into social uh, media groups, chat rooms, things like that. These kids, uh, in some cases, have iPhones, and they can get the Bible, they can get commentaries, they can get sermons such as ours and others. Um, the world is open to us, folks, as never, ever before. It's an exciting time. You'll be witnesses. I used to think when I first saw that verse, that meant when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I have that power, I'm going to have the boldness to speak out. And that's true. But as I got older in the Lord, I began to realize you'll be witnesses for me means not just using your lips, but using your life. Your life of purity. Your life of holiness. Because, you know, people will listen to your lips a little bit, but when they find the life is not there, the consistency is not there, they're going to tune you off pretty quickly, and the witness is gone. But when the witness is strong and the witness is pure and it's Christ-like, even if you don't get your lips open as often as you should, they're going to come to you and say, they're not even sure what they're going to say. They're just kind of hanging around you. My wife has this happen with a couple of residents at work. They're just kind of hanging around. Well, she's pretty and she's worth hanging around with, but it's more than that. They're looking also to find out, as my mother used to say, what are you eating for breakfast? In other words, what do you have which makes you different? There's something about you that I want. And these fellows don't even know what it is, but they just there's something about the Lord in her that they're attracted to. And that's the way it should be with us. So to have the power of being a witness, yes, the boldness to speak, but also the boldness to live a life of holiness and righteousness and uh, the life of Jesus Christ among the people around. So that's the power. All right, what's going to happen? And where, how's that power going to come? I want that relationship. I want that baptism. My mother used to say, I want all that God has for me. If there's more, I want it. And so we're going to find out about that in the book of Acts. Now, verse 9. Now, when he, Jesus, had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. 
So the Lord is talking with them, and they're no doubt walking and talking. And he says in verse 9, uh, whatever he, these last words, you'll receive power. And then suddenly a cloud comes, and he disappears into the cloud, and he leaves them. They're on the Mount of Olives, which is just east of Jerusalem. And you've all seen the skyline of the photograph of Jerusalem. That photographer is standing on the Mount of Olives. So he's there on the Mount of Olives, and this cloud comes, and he just disappears in it. The same kind of cloud, no doubt, that led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years, known as the Shekinah, the glory of God. That same cloud that's going to return with him when he comes with power and the witnesses, the angels, and the believers. And incidentally, when he took off from the Mount of Olives, when he returns, one of the prophets tells us he will land on the Mount of Olives, which will split. And that's another whole story. And water is going to flow from the throne and on and on it's going to go. Well, they suddenly see him leave. And now these angels are there to explain what happened. They looked steadfastly into heaven. Can you imagine? They're talking to the Lord and suddenly he's rising up in this cloud. And uh, they're kind of just saying, golly, what's going on? And uh, now these two men who are in white apparel, who are angels, say to them, verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So when Jesus returns, he is going to come from the east and he is going to land on the Mount of Olives, coming down just the way he went up. So now they're alone. For the first time, Jesus is not with them. Oh, he was not with them for those three days of the weekend and those were long, long days without him. But now they uh, go back to Jerusalem. They leave them out of Olives, which is a Sabbath day's journey that is incidentally three quarters of a mile because even among Orthodox Jews today, you cannot drive a car and uh, you cannot go more than a Sabbath day's journey and they figure that is three quarters of a mile. My old house that I had in Albany is in that area uh, where a lot of Orthodox Jews would live and they would live there because they could get to the synagogues over on Whitehall Road, which were less than three quarters of a mile. And that's all they could do. And on a Saturday morning, I would see a lot of Jewish families uh, all dressed up in their uh, particular uh, clothing, uh, walking to the synagogue, or in some cases coming back, um, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, when they had entered, they went up into an upper room. They're in Jerusalem. And they were staying there, Peter, who's their leader, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. This is not Judas Iscariot. He's already dead now, the traitor, but this is another Judas. Now these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So in this upper room, 120 we're going to see in the next verse, there are 120 people here, and we have the original 11 disciples, minus Judas, the one from Iscariot. What are they doing with their time? They're not talking, they're not playing games, they're not on the internet. There is no internet anyway at that time. What are they doing? What you and I should do when we have a little peaceful time, they're in prayer and they're in supplication. Uh, prayer is petitioning God and supplication is really getting down to business. Heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, Lord, please minister, please move. And uh, they continued in that frame of mind of prayer uh, and the women were also there, and Mary Magdalene certainly, and, and uh, some of the others, but also his precious mother. The mother of Jesus was there, and uh, remember she was now living with John, the Baptist, and his, I mean, not John, John the uh, disciple, and his wife, no doubt, and um, she was being taken care of, but his brothers are now there, and the brothers were not saved prior to the... Uh, crucifixion and resurrection. 
we know from Paul that Jesus on Resurrection Sunday visited his brother James. James, who wrote the book of James. James, who would become the head of the church in Jerusalem. He also must have visited Jude, who wrote the little book of Jude, and other brothers as well. I wonder about the sisters. They're not mentioned here. I wonder if they were saved. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. They probably all were saved. In any event, they're there, they're praying, and they're um, just uh, going before the Lord. They're in one accord. And verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. So Peter is still their leader at this time. James is a brand new believer, but James will become the leader of the church in a matter of a very short time. Uh, Peter will then go on out and become more of a, an evangelist and he'll spread more than, of course, Paul will really take the gospel to the world. But um, there's some business as far as Peter is concerned. And I want you to listen to this fisherman. Now, these fishermen and the others that, called, that Jesus called were not educated in the schools the way Paul was, the way the rabbis were. Uh, they didn't have the knowledge formally learned necessarily the way the Sanhedrin priests did, but they knew the word of God. They knew it in school. They knew it from their homes. Listen to this common everyday fisherman handle the word of God. He'll take a couple of Old Testament prophecies dealing with something else and apply it to this situation. Not only to know scripture, but ah, to be able to apply scripture. That's a good prayer for me and for you. Lord, I want to just not know Scripture, but I want to be able to apply it. I want to take those Old Testament prophecies and see them applied in my life, in the lives of others. So here's this fisherman, Peter, verse 16. Men and brethren, this Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. So he's got a couple of scriptures there that he's bringing forth from the Old Testament to apply to this particular day in which they live. Therefore, of these men who have accomplished, uh, have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and also Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So this is the story of how Matthias is chosen to replace Judas, because apparently there had to be twelve. Now that number twelve is important, and even among the Jews to this day, uh, they have to have twelve men to be able to start a synagogue or a meeting. Uh, when they didn't have twelve men, they have to have some women, and Paul's going to find that when he goes to Philippi and there aren't enough, there are not 12 Jewish men to start a synagogue and so they have to have women gathering down by the water to have their meetings. So they need to have 12. 12 is an important number. 12 is an important number of government as I recall. And uh, we had 12, we lost Judas, we need to replace him. So Peter now is using scripture. My late mother, again, I'll make reference to her when she would listen to these teachers on television or radio or talking to them. Uh, they start to make these statements and she'd say, in, in love but challenging, give me chapter and verse. She taught me, honey, when you teach, give chapter and verse. I learned as a lawyer when you would go before the Supreme Court or the appellate division 
Uh, first of all, you go before the appellate division, your knees are knocking, uh, you're so nervous. But you go before a Supreme Court judge or the Court of Appeals, um, you get up there and say, well, I think the law ought to say this, and I think it ought to be nonsense. Counselor, give us the cases that hold this way. Give us, they would not say chapter and verse, they'd say, give us the precedent. Where in the law, what book, give me the page number where the law has held what you say should be the case. So you never got out of law school uh, unless you knew that. And so every lawyer who's trained knows how to make sure that the case that holds to his position is given clearly. And so it is in the Bible. Give me chapter and verse. Where does it say thus and such? And that's one of the faults we find too much in teaching even today. A lot of I thinks and a lot of I think it ought to be Forget that. Who cares what you and I think? It's what God says. And where does he say it? So I can look it up for myself. All right? He says, men and brethren, verse 16, this scripture had to be fulfilled. This scripture about replacing Judas, uh, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David. So the Holy Spirit was in David's mouth when he wrote uh, about the situation. Now, David didn't talk about Judas. He was talking about the unrighteous uh, and his time in Psalm 41. He was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Judas was with them for the full three and a half years. And now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Remember how he sold the Lord? For what, 30 pieces of silver was it? He took that money and he went out and he bought a field. And it was wages of iniquity, and uh, elsewhere we know he hanged himself. Here we know that he fell headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all the entrails gushed out. Some might say, well, was he hanged, or did he just fall over and have his guts opened up? Maybe both. Maybe he hung and somebody cut him down and he split open. Anyway, not a nice ending to be sure. Uh, And it became known to people in Jerusalem that this field was purchased by blood money. He purchased this money and and saw the blood of Jesus shed. Nobody wanted to live there. So they had to uh, make that a field where people who were uh, travelers who did not know the Lord, didn't have any any place. They were really basically just sojourners. If they died, they would just bury them there. In any event, um, verse 20, it talks about the scripture from Psalms, uh, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. So no one's going to take the place of Judas as far as that house is concerned. No one's going to put a house on his property. That's why they used it as a burial place for those that had no home. Uh, And let another take his office. Again, quoting scripture. Everything needs to be done by the word of God. Now, I've been talking about teachers need to give you chapter and verse. What about my life? I think I'm going to do this, and I think I'm going to do that, and I want to live my life this way. No, no, no. Our lives should be lived by chapter and verse. Lord, what do you want me to do, and what is the scripture that governs my life? You and I should have all of our actions line up with the word of God. We should be able to say, what I'm doing here lines up with God's word. I'm ministering to this person. I'm baking a casserole for that person. I'm giving a ride to the other one. I'm... uh, praying for this one, everything that we do should line up with Scripture. There ought to be a precedent for what we're doing. So we need to get this office replaced. And so they go to those men who had been with them for the whole three and a half years, and there were a lot more than just the 12. We know at least two more men who were there from the beginning besides the 12. One of them was Joseph, called Barsabas. The other one was Matthias. And they did something which they did in the Old Testament, which they would never, ever do again. Uh, Verse 24, you know, O Lord, the hearts of all. Show us which of these two you have chosen. So God knows the heart. He knows who he wants to choose. But here is the last time they're going to do that. They're going to cast lots to see God's choice. Verse 25, uh, they're going to take part in this ministry of apostleship. They're going to take Judas's place. Um, and so they're going to minister in Jesus' name, and there'll be apostles in his name. This, this new replacement will be an apostle. The word apostle, apostolos in the Greek, means somebody sent forth with a commission. And so they cast lots. They cast lots in the Old Testament. Um, 
The Urim and the Thummim were a uh, form of lot. And we don't know what Urim and Thummim were. It means lights and perfections in the Hebrew. Um, some think it was a black stone and a white stone. Uh, you'll notice the questions that David asks often are given a yes and no answer. Some think that the priest had the Urim and the Thummim in the pouch and he would take these stones and he would ask a question, is it yes or no? And if it was a black stone, it was no. And if it was a white stone, it was yes. We don't know. In any event, there were lots. How do you know God's will? The Holy Spirit didn't live inside of anybody in the Old Testament. The only person he lived in all the time was from birth, John the Baptist, and then of course Jesus. And we're going to see soon all believers once they come to the Lord. The Bible talks about the lot. Proverbs says that God is the one, though man casts the lot, God determines how the lot's going to come out, the sovereignty of God. So they cast lots, and um, the lot falls on Matthias. He becomes uh, one of the twelve, taking Judas's place. Next week, the Lord willing, if we're all here and not in heaven, and if we are, great, we'll hear this message up there. We want to find out about the Holy Spirit and about that power. I want that power. I want to be immersed in that power, and I want to know what that power is. So if you can't wait till next week, then uh, I'm going to give you a fast forward real quickly. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the Holy Spirit come upon them. Verse uh, uh, 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Suddenly, they're speaking in a language they had never spoken in before. In this occasion, it's going to be earthly languages in order to impress the Jews who are coming in from all over the world on the day of Passover uh, celebration. And they, um, uh, there's a Pentecost on this occasion. They're coming in from all over the world. And um, this will be Pentecost, I think. I'm not certain. Um, and they're going to be so impressed with the fact that these Jews are speaking in their foreign languages. So now we're beginning to see the power of the Holy Spirit come, and it's because of tongues. Chapter 10 has Peter going to talk to Cornelius and some other Gentiles. He's talking, and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they so I see these Gentiles speaking with other tongues and praising God. Chapter 19, the Apostle Paul is going to be talking to the um, Ephesians. And he'll ask if they have the Holy Spirit. They've never heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, he gets them baptized in water and they speak with tongues. So we begin to see from these scriptures and then from Paul's talking about tongues in the Corinthian epistle that the key to the baptism in the Holy Spirit is going to be the power that comes. And that power is going to come through speaking with other tongues. How can that be? What is tongues? Paul will tell us in Corinthians that tongues is prayer, it's praise, it's petition, it's speaking of the wonderful works of God. We will see in Acts chapter 2. So how do you get power with God? One simple way, prayer. And what's the most powerful form of prayer? The purest form. Nothing wrong with praying in our own language. God wants us to do that, urges us to do that. But tongues is spiritual prayer from God, the Holy Spirit. He gives you the language. You begin to pray in this language. You don't know what you're saying. But as you do, you begin to sense the power of God for boldness, for miracles, for other gifts being unlocked, such as gifts of healings and miracles and prophecy. And uh, now there's some who get confused and say tongues is not for everyone. They look at 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul does say there is what we call the gift of various kinds of tongues. That's a tongue in the assembly, followed by an interpretation. That's to teach and to edify and to petition. But we're talking about everyday garden variety tongues, which is for all believers, because God wants all believers to have that advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are times when you're not sure how to pray. Tongues is a wonderful way to pray, because you don't know what to pray about, but the Holy Spirit knows. And I find when I get into tongues that the Lord begins to give me a peace and sometimes a revelation and uh, a power comes, a boldness comes, the fear goes, the anxiety, the questions. So if you um, uh, don't have that gift of tongues, if you're here tonight, I'd like to pray with you before you leave so we can re have you receive it. You'll definitely receive tongues. If you're on your own through YouTube or listening uh, by radio or by um, the internet somehow, um, 
pray. Ask God to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. I've had people um, call me on the phone. I've prayed for them to receive uh, the baptism. I've had people in, in China and elsewhere email me, and I would email them a prayer back, and they would pray that and receive tongues. So I don't care where you are. You can be in Iraq, Iran, whatever. Text me we'll, or, or email me. We'll, we'll make sure you get to speak in tongues. It's the dynamic. It's, it's prayer. That's what all tongues really is, is pure, perfect prayer from God. We'll see that unfold in the days ahead. But get all that God has for you. And for those tongue talkers like me, and I hope like you, word of caution, speaking in tongues at one time is valuable for that one time every day as often as you can. Pray in tongues because that power can come and it can go. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave, but the power can be there. And if you don't stay at the top of your game, it's going to be drained from you. Stay in the Word, stay in prayer, in English and in tongues. Jude talks about it as well, praying in the Holy Spirit as well as understanding. So powerful, powerful book ahead of us. I hope you'll stay with us for this study. Uh, the promise of the Spirit. He's going to come on the day of Pentecost. I was questioning whether it was Passover or Pentecost. Verse 1 tells us when the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover had come, the Holy Spirit came and that will be the birth of the church. And from then on, believers will have the Holy Spirit indwelling them in their very hearts. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're grateful for the chance to be in your word. We love your word. And it's our food and it's our life. Help us to be excited about it. And for those that are not excited about the word, Lord, ignite them. Several times in my life, I became bored with the word. And I was a teacher of your word and I had to confess it. And you gave me a hunger. And I pray for those that are bored with the word. Don't, don't want to get into it. That you'll find a way for them to get excited about it. Maybe it's going to be, a, be downloading it on their iPhone or on their iPad or on their computer or getting the CD and putting it in the car uh, radio system. But Lord, help us to get the word in us some way and to be excited about it. And Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon all who hear the sound of my voice. Baptize them with the Holy Spirit. May they come forth in tongues and praise and pray and petition you for the rest of their lives. Lord, give us the power to be able to go into our Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem and the whole world to share the good news of the kingdom of God through the King himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen.